morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rochelle Samuel, and I am the Director of Complaints and Discipline at the College. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this educational session led this morning by Tina Gandhi. Before I introduce our speaker for today's session, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. As part of our ongoing efforts to leverage technology to increase accessibility, all parts of AMID, including this educational session, will have live captions. To turn on the captions, click the Show Captions button below to view our live captions in either English or French. And if you require any assistance at any point during this live uh, event, this year's event, there is also a live support desk found on the bottom left of your screen. And you can click on the pink chat bubble and you'll be connected with our live support if you need any assistance. Now, following this year's AMED, we invite you to complete a post feedback form to share your experience of this year's two day virtual event. The feedback form will be sent to you via email two days after the event, or a few days after the event, rather. So, you want to make sure you look out for that in your email. The feedback, of course, is very important for us because it will help us plan next year's event. Once you complete the feedback form, you will have access to a link to the certificate of participation, which you can fill out and print off for your records. And your attendance at AMID, including your participation in this session, can count towards the completion of your continuing competence program. I want to remind uh, everyone that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation, and this is a very a very important topic, so I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Uh, members can submit their questions through the chat feature to the right of the screen on the virtual portal, and I'll be reading the questions aloud for Tina to respond. Now, we will do our best to answer as many questions as time permits, and if there are questions that are left unanswered, Tina will be logging into the virtual portal to review outstanding questions and connect with attendees, so thank you for that, Tina. In order to accommodate questions from as many members as possible, we would ask that you limit yourself to one question only if possible. Now, let's begin the educational session. I'm very pleased to introduce you all to Tina Gandhi. Tina is a registered social worker for over 20 years with expertise in the areas of mental health, child welfare, and disability. She is a social worker for the TREAD, that's T-R-E-AD program at Surrey Place counseling diverse families, couples, siblings, and individuals, and leading parent support groups for parents and family members of children with autism in a specialized Section 23 classroom program. She values interdisciplinary teamwork and community collaboration to support families. She brings a passion for mental wellness and innovation to her work by creating various workshops and groups to best meet families' needs. She is a master level assist suicide prevention trainer and a mental health ambassador for Surrey Place. Her previous work experiences have included leading multidisciplinary children's mental health teams, intensive child and family counseling, and co-leading concurrent parent and child therapy groups. Now today's educational session will focus on the development and value of the unique role with families of children with autism. T Tina will highlight for us assessment models and measurement tools to evaluate progress, discuss the creation of various groups based on client need, especially during the pandemic, the needs of families and siblings, the importance of a systemic community, an interdisciplinary approach, and outline the various counseling intervention models that have been effective with diverse families. So at this point, please join me in welcoming Tina Gandhi. Tina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate that wonderful introduction. Um, I wanted to tell you how much I'm so passionate about what I do, and you're going to hear that in this talk, and you're going to really enjoy a lot of the things that I have to say around working with families and parents with autism. I'm just sharing my screen now. So just to talk to you a little bit about the journey that I've had. So I've been in a social worker for over 20 years. My, both of my parents are social workers. Um, I've worked in the field for many, many years in different roles. So from children's mental health to child welfare, and now in autism. It's a very different and diverse background in terms of the, my work experience, but very exciting. I also pioneered this role. So what makes me unique is that I'm the only social worker on this team that I work with right now. So I can pioneer my role and 
be the lead lead in terms of what the work I can do. So in terms of what groups, um, I have taken the lead in creating a, my own parent support group for these families. I take on the family counseling, the sibling counseling, the couple counseling, all of this is just me for the whole team. There's a, there's a group called the Positive Adult Development Group that I co-developed with someone and we co-led this wonderful group for parents who had just been diagnosed. So in terms of trying to look at different innovative ways to create my role and my what I can offer the team, I've been doing that. The other thing that I've been doing is creating pre and post measures in the research. So being able to evaluate stress levels before and after working with social work. Um, that's really helpful for the research department and also just for the team to understand that stresses decrease after working with me. I've also been asked to be the mental, well, mental wellness ambassador for where I work. So things like the Zumba, so I like to do Zumba. Um, I do that for fun, I'll do that for staff, I'll do that for clients. That's something that I've provided as well as some mental health trainings because this is an area I'm extremely passionate about. So yes, they will give you the Not Myself Today material but I always add my own spin to it and my own material. I'm also really, passionate about group work. So I created this parent support group through my workplace and it I sort of we did a trial model with some of my former students will remember we did a couple of trials with four sessions each and now it's become an ongoing group especially virtually that's been continuing to go and the families absolutely love it. They look forward to it every week. These are diverse racialized families who've experienced a lot of racialized trauma and who understands them best, right? I do. Um, and again, it's because of the fact that, you know, the people in our field understand things better than other fields, right? So we are the people who can really make that impact with families. I'm also like Marcy Gray. Um, we actually met, we're, we're friends at the um, CIS training. So I'm a master level assist trainer and Marcy and I present together quite a bit. So we are very familiar with each other's work and I highly respect her. We both understand how to support high risk communities. We've done that together. We also, the other thing that I do is provide training and information sessions for students, MSW students of University of Toronto and Laurier on social work and disability, because it's an area that's very new in terms of the work that we do, it's a niche area. And so to be able to provide some information, some knowledge, some ideas around even suicide, talking about what the disability, the impact on the family, it's really helpful for new MSW students. So my agenda today is to talk about the role that we can have working with families of children who have disabilities, talk about various assessment approaches from biopsychosocial model, some of the pre and post measures, some of the type of um, ideas in terms of how I conceptualize working with families and treatment wise, talking a lot about acceptance and commitment therapy, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, just sharing a few of those techniques. Obviously, you can use any approach. I also like emotion focused therapy. So there's different ways and different approaches that we can use working with families, being creative, but also, as you're well aware of working in the field, being where the family is at, being where the clients are at. So making sure that we're not moving too fast or too slow, making sure that we keep checking in to make sure the families are comfortable and okay, and um, just a lot of collaboration. There's been some research done on working with parents of children with autism. So um, ACT has done a lot of great work. There's some great pilots happening. So I wanna share a little bit about that because I was one of the people trained in ACT and that's something that I use and what I would like to see for social work. So what we found is because like I said, I'm the only social worker on my team, there are social workers in the adult program and I'm so grateful for them. We need more, we need, <laughs> we need more of us. So. Um, where am I going to refer the families after they're finished with my program? There's nobody. So that's the problem. We need more social workers at diagnosis and throughout the process. I want to talk about the need for more social workers and social service workers throughout this entire process of the diagnosis and, and living with a disability, living with autism. There's a huge impact and there's a huge need. So policymakers, we need, we need more, of, um, more social workers out there. Please make sure that they're hiring more and looking at that from an agency perspective, because one person can only do so much. And then we have to sort of pass on cases. We have to close. And where are we going to put these people and make them feel safe afterwards? 
So in terms of the role that I have, it's basically looking at an overall picture and assessment of what's happening in the family from a systemic perspective. So, you know, the individual, the family, the community, their, how they're connected to other people, their extended family, who are their supports, who are their neighbors, all the people in their life that they find really helpful and supportive. How is the home impacting their life every day? So whether there's an impact on this, the sibling, whether there's an impact on the couple, whether there's an impact on the family, those things have an impact on the child. And so that environment of high levels of stress is there on this child and the family. And a lot of family breakdowns and crisis are happening because they're too busy managing the behaviors and they're not even, they're basically here and now and it's so overwhelming for families. Their level of stress is really through the roof. So being empathic, being understanding, understanding that level of coping and stress, these, we are the people who are qualified to understand. They're kind of saying this statement, they're saying they're a bit overwhelmed or something about paperwork, but really what they're really feeling is they want to feel heard. They want to feel understood and they're feeling that they can't cope anymore, but we can sort of piece out what they're really trying to say to us. We can also bring together supports, resources, and funding and all that. Typically in the disability field, they actually have that farmed out to someone else. So that is um, what they call a service coordinator, case manager. So we don't typically deal with those issues as much. However, I'm sure I hear it all the time because families give us everything. Um, so those issues do come, you know, to us around I, I, what about this funding and what about that thing? You, you hear the stressors around that or how do I hire a new respite worker? So those things come up in, in our sessions every once in a while. And of course, we are the family advocates. So I'm in those team meetings saying, this is what the family wants. And I'm working really hard to be that voice for the family um, because they don't have the voice themselves. Often we have team meetings without the families. And so we need to make sure that their voice is heard. And I am that person for sure. I'm always working hard for the family. The systems navigation piece is something where we have to think about where is the family going to go from here in the child system. We know the adult system has 20, 30 year wait lists for group home placements. The funding is much less. So the level of services and supports besides the amazing social workers, um, there just isn't there. So what else can we do to help support families saying, OK, your child is going to get bigger. They're going to get stronger. You're getting older. What are your plans for your future? Have you thought about a voluntary group home placement? Have you thought about long-term planning? Are there things like lights program? So different programs out there or different ideas and thoughts about the future, which you've never had that conversation before until they've met with me. I'm telling you, I've met with so many families. The kids are 10 or 12 years old. And the first time they've had a conversation about their grief and diagnosis is when they meet me. The first time they've had a conversation about long-term planning, about how they're coping, is with me, the tears are coming the first time they meet with me. So we know that these families need support from day one. Why does it have to take so long to come to me? It's unfortunate. So they also need to understand what is a systems navigation. So they apply for funding, they look for services. What is their future? What kind of resources do they need to exhaust in order to get to that group home planning? It's a lot of work and it's a multiple, multiple conversations. Again, knowing that we are the most qualified to have multiple conversations, not just one. Oh, they didn't want respite. That's great. They said that last year. Today, they are saying that they are interested, but I've had five conversations with them. I've had 15 conversations about group homes. Every week we have the same topics. Those are the things that we talk about, but it's not just a one-time thing. And that's unfortunately sometimes the feedback you'll hear from other people. And it's like, no, that doesn't work like that. But social workers and social service workers understand that more than anyone else, that we need to kind of revisit things because people shift and their minds are always thinking about different things. And once they learn more information and reduce many of those barriers, they're going to be in a different place. So again, talking about long-term planning and placement, those are the conversations that we can have. So working on an interdisciplinary team, I, have, I work with behaviorists, psychology, a pediatrician, developmental pediatrician, nurse, and we have a consulting psychiatrist, and then there's me. So what I do is often share, there's a high level of behavior, the family's really stressed out, the family's overwhelmed, they haven't slept last night, and I talk a lot about how that impacts the child in the classroom. How are they going to manage every day? Because I work with the Section 23 classroom, which means these kids' behaviors are extremely high. And so they're really struggling with how to manage every day. 
sometimes there's something around child protection or some involvement. Those are the things that I can update the team. I can talk about how they're feeling about residential placement. How are they coping every day? And then we have every six weeks we meet about as one particular case. But basically for me, that's a meeting every week to update the school team as a large group, as well as the interdisciplinary team to share our updates without breaching too much confidentiality, but just trying to share the family's level of stress is high. Their coping is low. They need this intervention. They're finding the group help full. Those type of things will help the team be able to manage their child. So I'm that bridge being between the families and the schools and trying to help bridge some of those issues. So a lot of families have language issues, so they need interpreters, making sure that when we work with interpreters, we're not using a lot of jargon and we're not using a lot of big language that's gonna, can be confusing, but keeping it very simple. What kind of interpreter do they need? Can we use the same one? Making sure that that cultural diversity, the aspects of their lives are being reflected and being understood. And again, we are the only ones qualified to do that. So we can identify what's happening with those language. Did you fully understand that that safety plan? Did you fully understand everything that was being said? Let me know if you're still concerned about this. We can do that check-in. Um, so we provide a lot of updates. Then there's the paperwork, right? The reports, the treatment progress reports, the discharge reports, the initial formulation, all of those things get covered um, in terms of some of the documentation that has to be communicated. But I always pressure families, I push them and I say, please make sure that you know what's happening with your child's treatment. When you get that treatment progress report, make sure you ask for meetings so that you're fully informed of what's going on so that you're not surprised by anything making sure you have those frequent meetings to talk about treatment. The other thing is I provide a social work at psychosocial assessment. So sometimes I'm just asked to say, do you think this family would be amenable to being a part of a program because they have so many other issues going on? Would they be open to it? Would they be ready? So there's been times where I've been asked to do that. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a case scenario and I want you to imagine being that social worker, social service worker when you first meet the family. You meet a mother. She says to you, I can't take it any longer. I can't manage my son's behavior at home. His level of aggression is so high. I just can't do it anymore. He's constantly hitting me and bruising me and pulling my hair and always hitting himself to the point where he's bleeding. I can't do it. She feels alone. She feels overwhelmed and she feels so stressed out. She doesn't understand things being told to her because of her language and she doesn't know where else to turn. So the, the father says to me, I know there's stress at home. I know the managing behaviors are so difficult and I know this affects my marriage, but I don't know how to support my wife. I have to work full time to support this family. What am I supposed to do? I wish I could be at home to support her and help her out, but I have to work these hours to support the family and now I'm afraid of losing my job. I don't want to be laid off from my job because there's always layoff. I'm, I'm living in fear of at work. They always, my company always has layoffs. I wish I could be more patient with my wife, but the stress of losing my job and supporting the family is taking a real toll on me. I really need someone to talk to about my fears and worries. And I know that she's going through a lot. I worry about her becoming anxious and depressed at home. So when I meet with this family, at one point, the mother says, I don't think life is worth it, worth it anymore. I think I want to hurt myself. I want to kill myself. So I have to do an assist intervention. I have to work with this family on suicide. That's one thing I have to do. Another thing that happens to the family at one point is the mother has a car accident. So she develops symptoms of PTSD. She's got nightmares. She's, she's really struggling with getting out of the house. She's having flashbacks, but she really wants to see me for sessions. The first time in months, she comes out of the house. She comes to see me for sessions. She says, I really need to work on my thoughts and feelings. She doesn't see anyone else. She sees the social worker because that's the value of relationship. Imagine she's been going through flashbacks and nightmares and constantly thinking about that car accident, but she comes to therapy. She couldn't even drive before. So I talked to her about her thoughts and feelings around her PTSD. 
they, it talks about at some point, we also talk about long term planning and what we can do next. Those are the type of cases that I deal with every day. This is this is every day for me. This is the reality of what the role that we might have. These are the type of families that and situations that they go through and they don't even know where to turn. They're, this kid was 15 years old and they had never ever have spoken about the situation that they've been experiencing at home. When I did some pre and post measures, I found that their coping and stress levels were through the roof. So it was highly elevated. So those measures that I'm using are vetted through a psychologist. We went through many, many measures together and we figured out what were the simplest ones. And so when I score them or send them for scoring, they go to research and psychology to get scored. So what I did with this family is that I met with them every two weeks to talk to them about their marriage and how they can really communicate with one another with the use of translator, of course. And I use the same translator to, in, in order to have that positive relationship and for help to help them bond with feeling comfortable talking openly about those issues. I talked to them about coping. I talked to them about their level of stress. We talked to them about those options around long-term planning. The special needs team with Luminous Skylark was activated. So that's basically a, a team that can help plan for long-term planning. So again, we worked on long-term planning. I helped them with coping and stress. We talked about marital counseling, and then I had to do an assist intervention. And imagine having that assist intervention when you're, you know, the doorknob, right? So when you're walking out, the, when you're trying to end the session or they have to go, and that's, that's when you get the, the information about suicide. It's very, very interesting, right? But that's how it always works with our families. It's never quite black and white and clear. It always happens when we're dealing with a multitude of stressors talked a lot about the PTSD work, and of course, building that sense of community and collaboration because these, this family felt completely isolated. They're a racialized family. They didn't know anybody. As I said, the mother didn't speak the language. Of course, as a result of that work, there was decrease after each session. There were no further thoughts of suicide again. The partners understood each other. They were able to problem solve. I was able to get a safety plan. The mother was able to leave and saw me more for more sessions through the PTSD work. And the child's been placed, which was helpful for the parents because the needs were so high. And the family has now reached out to other families right now. I'm, I'm dealing with multiple families that are looking for placement and they've been supportive to other families since then. This is a family from many years ago and they still continue to support the families in the program now. They want to be able to give back. So this is sort of the type of situation that I would be dealing with. The assessment tool. So one of them is the social work interview. So you're very familiar with the biopsychosocial model, which I'll kind of briefly go over with you. The goal setting is done together. Everything's mutually done. We always work together. We always collaborate. We always talk about what do you want to work on? How can we best work together? The questionnaire resources and stress, as I was saying, it's a psychological test. It's just a quick check mark and they score it. How stressed out are you? What are the various domains? I'm going to get into that in a moment, as well as the F copes. So again, just how are you coping and who are you referring to? You're very familiar with this model. The idea of who's in your relationships, what are the family circumstances, I have a few families where they're worried about, are they going to be kicked out because the landlords, they're raising their rent or telling them to move, are they worried about their coping, do they have other supports, are there other family members, often siblings are be bearing the burden of what's going on, um, are they flexible in terms of their approach and, and willingness to work, um, and as well as their own family relationships, racialized trauma, other his history of trauma, the things that a lot of these families are going through flashbacks and nightmares, anxiety and stress every day. What is their ge genetic vulnerability? Are there other people with disability in the family? What are their family circumstances? Um, and so, and do they have other people to talk to? So or do they have a support network? So it's very, obviously our families have multiple issues and multiple concerns that we have to address right from the beginning. So this particular psych testing, psych, assessment is called the FCOPES. And so these are the type of domains that are part of the FCOPES. So basically looking at who's in the supports for the family, how are they able to, do they feel connected? Often neighbors know because the kids' behaviors are so high that it's actually upsetting to the neighbors. So 
typically they're not a uh, support for them, but there might be relatives. There might be extended family. There might be other friends that they have. Are they accessing those people? Are they able to reframe some of their incidents in their life as something a little bit more positive? Do they have a connection to their church? Are they feeling spiritually supported? Do they seek out other supports or community resources to get help? And are they able to deal with situations without being reactive? So the a score is determined, and then you can do that at the beginning of service, and you can do that after the service. So here's some typical questions from that. Sharing our difficulties with relatives, looking at support from friends, knowing we have the power to solve their problems, getting advice from others, getting assistance from community agencies, knowing we have the strength to solve our problems, and reaching out to our family doctor, and basically trying to understand that stress could be a part of life and sharing our concerns with our friends. The next other assessment tool that I might use is a questionnaire resources and stress. And so basically having a parent rate very quickly, just a true or false, um, parent rating a parent and family pro problem. So the score comes out of 20. The, how are they rating their level of child behavior? Usually very high pessimism. So are they feeling negative or positive about their situation? And then their ability to manage their child, the child's ability to be, be able to function. So there's a score there that's that's developed. And I just want to give you some examples of some of the items on it. So do our, did the parents agree? Do they have disagreements? Are they worried about the future? Often, yes, that, that will be endorsed. The fact that this might, the, the demands for care limits the growth of someone else. What have I given up? To, me, to manage my child's needs? And what kind of strain does that put on me? And these, of course, everybody's gonna say yes to a lot of these, but their ability to access other supports, look at respite, look at other options will develop over time as we have more conversations about these things. So there's a lot of evidence based on those particular scores. And then I've noticed, obviously, stress levels go high at the end as well, because we're tr transitioning out of that school program. And we want to make sure that families feel well supported, but they often their stress levels increase because they're worried about how that's going to, what is discharge going to be like? And who am I going to turn to? Uh, who the, when the phone rings, is they're going to ask me to pick up my child again. So what am I going to do to mitigate that? So I also look at other indices of success. Are you going to see your family doctor? Are you going for a massage for yourself? Are you getting your physical? Are you going for a walk? Are you taking care of yourself? Those to me are big deals because I'm seeing those are the progress areas that we want to be able to help develop and work on. And they're not just something you can measure on a, on a piece of paper. So I always try to make sure that I'm keeping track of those small little things that help wellness and well-being of these parents and that's why I just track them as a qualitative measure we're still trying to figure out as a program where how else that can be recorded but just right now I'm just keeping track of it um, because I want to make sure that everybody's understood that there are some great gains that did happen with these families so we work together on some of the goals the families and myself so things like sibling counseling so knowing that there's an impact on the family and what else is going on with them, looking at the marriage. So um, what's happening with their marriage? Are they able to communicate together as a couple? And also co-parenting. So being sure that they're on the same page because often one parent is undermining what the other one is doing. Are they working together, right? So sometimes even siblings might have a mental health diagnosis of them, theirs themselves. Uh, Sometimes they're having difficulty coping. Sometimes they're dealing with the burden of everything on their plate. Um, so that's the things, that's why those things need to be addressed. And dealing with an aggressive child at home is very, it's, it's very trying. And sometimes children's aid is involved just to support, um, just because they're saying, well, I'm afraid of my brother or sister, but they know that the parents are doing everything they can. So they can only, they can't, there's not a lot of protection concerns, to be honest. Um, the families all talk about how they're coping in the family counseling. There's extended family issues. So sometimes parents perceive their their parents as a level of support. Sometimes they say they won't really understand that disability. Sometimes they're, the family lives far away, so they don't want to burden them. There's all these different things. Who is your support system for yourself? Have they discussed long-term planning? Have they discussed what their future is? And have they, are they aware of what happens in the adult system with this long wait list? 
for mental health issues, again, a lot of families are coming to me really exhausted, overwhelmed, anxious, dealing with either racialized trauma or PTSD of their own. How are they coping? And, and as I said, I'm meeting them for the first time and I'm seeing all of these things are developing right away. Are they sleeping? Um, are they managing their stress? Are they practicing any self-care? Guaranteed not. If you ask any parent of children with autism, how much time are you spending on yourself? The answer is zero. So that's why I incorporate that as part of the group. Um, who are they accessing for community supports? Most people don't even know who to turn to for support. What is the name of that role that they could ask for help? And what are the type of funding and supports that they can ask for? So the actual term is called a service coordinator. Who has that term in the top of their head? I heard it help them say, this is what you need to ask for. This is what will be helpful for you. We need someone to help basically spell it out for them so that they understand what they need to be asking for for supports. And a lot of times families are completely isolated. So do we need to help connect them? When I run the group, parents feel very connected. Are they connected to their cultural community? Do they feel isolated? Do they feel like nobody understands them? Sometimes for some families, going to the church is actually a great source of support because they are that have that wonderful sense of community and understanding. And so some of them have been speakers at their church and some of them have been advocates at their church. So it's wonderful to hear that. The other thing, of course, is that we have that awareness around the interpreter, right? So understanding why we would need interpreter, making sure everybody understands everything and what's the value in making, just reiterating everything for the family so that they completely understand what's going on. The approach I use is very systemic. So I spoke to that earlier around the individual family, group, community, all of those aspects of the family's life. And then subsystems of the, in the structural therapies, the parental subsystem, the sibling subsystem, being aware of all of those and how that impacts the family. The biopsychosocial model is also very evidence-based. And we know that there is a lot of research, which um, there's a lot of journal articles talking about the impact of siblings on the family and how the stresses impact them. There's a lot, a lot of research on parental stress for parents of children with autism. There's tons and tons and tons of articles that I have because I've done a lot of research on this um, saying that there's a lot of parental stress. Now, the majority of the articles are on mothers, but I'm telling you, I'm working with a lot of fathers right now and there's a lot of stress on them too. There's some single fathers and they're also bearing a lot of the burden. So we need to do a little bit more research on that, but there are some articles on that as well the value of group therapy, the value of all of those things that can help support families are so important. There's also a lot of great research happening around ACT. So um, the acceptance commitment therapy model working at um, Surrey Place and CAMH, we've done some excellent collaborations and working with the CBT model. So the idea is that the families can feel well supported in a very cohesive group. The other thing that um, I will do is talk to them about what they need. So whether it's addressing some of their anxiety, depression, trauma, or suicidal thoughts, helping them sort of navigate those things, talking about the various uh, models. So except I never say ACT, I say acceptance and commitment therapy. We're going to talk about how you can accept some of those thoughts. Here's some strategies. Um, something like there's an exercise called leaves on a stream, right? Just a very nice mindfulness exercise to help people feel calmer. I'm going to go through a couple of other exercises that I do, um, but having that sense of connection with other people with similar experiences, the positive adult development, it's just in its infancy stage, but there's some great research that we've done. I've done some pre and post measures and shown some excellent results with that. And that's a group that um, has shown, like I said, a little bit of research in journal articles, but not a lot. But the idea in, in terms of the parenting stress index is shown that there have been positive results. So getting intervention right at diagnosis is so important. We have parents in tears getting the diagnosis from the psychologist. They're wonderful. They're just, their role is to give the diagnosis. Who is there to deal with the emotions around that diagnosis and the impact and getting overwhelmed and getting bombarded with information and where do I start and what do I do? And I'm still in shock. Who's the only people who can deal with that? We are the one, only ones qualified. We are the ones that need to be there from the beginning so that we can help support them and help them understand what's going on. The other thing is the long-term placement and transition planning. It's very important that we are the ones that are involved with that because we know how to help support the families the best. 
So I really want to spend some time talking about parent groups because this is my area of passion and this is something that I had developed um, and I'd like to do more research on. Parent support groups for parents of children with autism help people feel more connected. I can't tell you how many times I've heard parents say, oh my gosh, it's so good to, that somebody else understands exactly what I'm going through. Who else can understand better? And these are high levels of behavior. I'm talking about 300 episodes of aggression, like hitting themselves, hitting other people, an hour. The parents are tired. They're exhausted. They're overwhelmed. Who else can they talk to? Who else understands them the best? These other parents. They decrease that sense of isolation. Right now, we're in a pandemic. We are dealing with people who are sitting in their homes all day long in a tight spaces, right? They're living far apart. I mean, I'm, I'm serving clients of Peel region, York region, Toronto region, everywhere. They're not able to kind of come together and meet in person. The easiest thing for them to do is get on teams and we meet together. Their kids in the background playing, no problem. They're having issues around the barriers around transit, uh, transportation, childcare. All of those things have been reduced by having a virtual parent support group. And again, they love, they're like connecting with the other kids. They're saying, oh, hi, how's so-and-so? We all love to see them on the screen. We welcome those interruptions. We, they say, I have to go, no problem. We have to deal with your behavior. This is not a place for judgment. We're here to support each other. And they ask about each other's kids. And they ask about the other parents. Say, how is so-and-so doing? I said, well, you're going to find out the group. They're able to connect with other people who've placed their child. So the residential placement process, there are parents who come to the group and say, I wanna tell you. And so they talk about, the parents will ask, what, is, what does it feel like? What is your anxiety like? What was your guilt like in terms of placing your child? What was that? What, how did you experience those emotions? And their parents are willing to do that and talk with you about it. It's a very diverse group. So again, having that mutual understanding of racialized trauma, having that mutual understanding of what it's like to be a person of color, to understand a lot of systemic barriers, to really experience even just similar, similar cultural things. It's amazing. There's this immediate awesome bond between all of the parents. They share their own resources. Oh, there's a vaccine clinic here. How do I do a haircut with this, with my kid having behaviors? All that resources, information sharing, they do it within each other in the group. What, what do you do about this form? They all answer each other's questions nicely and they, they, bring, they bring resources to each other and they say, I thought of you because I wanted you as a parent group to hear about this new thing that just came out that we just heard about. So a lot of the themes that I'm hearing, again, I talked to you about isolation. The parents have never left the house in 15 years. They need someone to talk to. They've never had any sense of community or social supports. They don't have family here. How else are they gonna to talk to anybody? They have guilt about planning for the future or thinking about residential. But if you're speaking with somebody who's been through the process, they can help debunk some of those worries and fears. Talking to them about what the adult system looks like and seeing that that might be a challenge for them when their kid is you know, 10, 10 or 20 years older, it might be really difficult. As I said, they've never had any time for themselves. Never, never, never. I've asked that question multiple times. What are you doing for yourself? That's just silence. Let's use time in our group to take care of you. So those mindfulness exercises, the leaves on a stream, whatever we can do to take five minutes to decompress you, to make you feel like you're a better parent for yourself. That's what we're going to do in group. So we carve out that time so that you feel supported. I don't want to make you do more homework, right? We don't need to make them do more. We need to make them do less and make them feel comfortable. And that's also a philosophy of emotion focused therapy modeling. So seeing what it looks like to have two respite workers in the home and we were able to do that during the pandemic gives them an, an idea of what what does respite really look like and how do they experience that and the parents saying you know what I feel a sense of relief now it's been much better to have someone with respite understanding what the long-term placement is like understanding and seeing oh my gosh yep I've seen that behavior before I've seen that face before about how stressed you are I've experienced that I've been there advocacy asking about IPRC process, the SIP grant, all of those things in the process, they can help each other, support each other with the transition planning and what language to use. And I'm telling you the physical health, oh my goodness. Anxiety, depression, thoughts of suicide, nervous breakdowns, mental breakdowns, 
issues around their diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, lack of sleep, high blood pressure, tiredness, weight issues, dizziness, and not being able to concentrate or remember. So I always text families as a reminder because I know they have a million things on their plate and that's totally fine with me. The stressors around jobs, the stressors around the financial impact of the how they're managing right now during the pandemic, the stressors around their relationships with neighbors and the lack of support from other families. So finances, jobs, all of those things right now are a big deal because of the pandemic, lack of sleep. So often they're sleeping with their child just to function and it's not great because it's not healthy for them either. They're not getting proper rest. How much time are they spending as a couple? Zero. Um, and they're exhausted and overwhelmed. And they're dealing with these ongoing crises all the time and the impact of the siblings. In terms of respite, they've never had a break for themselves. Like I said, from some families, it's been 15 years. They've never left the house. It's important to talk to them about having a break for themselves. It's okay. You're, I know you're going to feel a little guilty, but it's healthy for you. And you don't have to go get a worker to send them out. You get a worker to come in and watch how they're doing and see if you're comfortable with them and then uh, have them take them out. It's not about that. Or it's not about putting your kid in overnight. No, no, we're not there yet. You're not, you're not ready. It's okay. Um, and whether or not that worker can manage their children. But the parents also need self, self-care and managing their stress as well. So some of the group factors that are really important to think about and are well researched by Yalom, who is the group guru, um, are the things like installation of hope, right? So being able to understand that there is some hope in their situation, there's light at the end of the tunnel sometimes, I see my future when I talk to so-and-so, it's really helpful for me. That idea that everyone has that shared experience, so knowing what other people are going through, um, having that immediate connection that everyone is going, that through similar things and they're not alone. Imparting information, so sharing things like treatment options, their feelings of guilt, what's residential placement look like, all of those different options. The idea of helping others. So they feel better by helping someone else through a situation. I have group members that come just to support other people, to give them that sense of connection and that they don't feel alone, but they're not necessarily needing a high needs for themselves, but they're there to support others. That's a beautiful experience. It helps them build self-esteem and adaptive coping. And it helps them share their concerns about other things like group home placement and guilt and difficulty finding respite workers, difficulty trying to go through all the self injurious behaviors and aggression at home and the struggles with all of those things. So with the family looking at things like, um, oh yeah, so here's an experience of interpersonal learning. I had an older sibling who comes into the group and we're working with a lot of parents but she kind of acts as a caregiver. So she shared that the impact of that long-term placement and managing all of the family needs is made, played a huge burden on her. And what that did for the rest of the group was actually shift a lot of the parents thinking to say, oh, I better not put that burden on myself and put it on, the, on that child that's older sibling. I actually need to think about long-term planning because if I put it on the stress on that older sibling like this person shared, oh my gosh, that is too much stress. And so that insight was able to shift other people's thinking regarding future planning and not placing the burden on the siblings only. And they realized that they need to start planning for the children's future. So they have to um, not place the burden on their siblings and they need to plan for their future and not assuming that the siblings will be able to take care of their child long-term. Other families share the impact of the disability on other family members. So family acceptance and cultural stigma, and those who have special needs. They learn different ways to talk about feelings with other people. So having that emotional corrective experience, working with single dads who are actually really involved, that might be a a new experience for them, having an involved parent, which is great. Um, And then also just looking at the looking at group home tours and people sharing pictures of what that might look like, Um, hiring workers that are sometimes that's a bit of a barrier, and their own experiences around placing their child. So again, the idea of group cohesiveness, so they feel more connected. They say that's their highlight of their week. They feel like a burden has been lifted off of them that they had before by coming to the group. 
being able to access respite and support, so that existential factors, exploring those residential and long-term placement options. So those are some of the things that happen in this magical group process, but it's, it actually is quite a bit of theory attached to having a positive group. So I think I've kind of covered a lot of the different types of interventions that are, that are there. I wanna to get to the cognitive behavioral therapy. So looking at something like a mind over mood sheet. So what went through my mind? How, what would I say to my best friend? How can I shift some of my thinking? What is the worst that could happen? But then what's another way of thinking about that? So again, your thoughts, I'm not good enough, affects your feelings. How do I'm um, feeling worthless and anxious and it affects my behavior. I start to isolate more. The matrix, the idea around that is that we have these goals and values and we work towards this committed action to help us work um, to be more positive and also just working towards our values. And the idea is that there's this other side where there's things that get in the way. So we have our internal barriers, things that we say to ourselves that I can't do this. And then we start getting into what we call avoidant behaviors um, where we sleep too much or we um, self-soothe or things like that. Those are behaviors that we engage in to kind of avoid what's going on. Doesn't mean that they're wrong or right. We're just noticing and choosing what's going on. And it's an important tool that we can use with families to say, okay, how do we work towards our values? But we're not going to judge you to say that these are the, the internal barriers are a bad thing. We're just noticing that they're happening and it's okay. It's not a judgmental activity. So we get the idea with this visual, again, of just what we're moving towards certain things and we're moving away from certain things. This is another activity that I like to rate and it can be used as a pre and post measure scale. And the idea behind that is that we work towards things that bring us pleasure in our leisure life. Where are we at with our work or education or personal growth and our relationships? And how do we work towards getting towards the middle? And we don't have to get rid right of the bullseye, but even if one or two steps to live fully towards our values and move towards that just helps us feel like we're taking care of ourselves a little bit more. And where would you like to be? So you can mark it with an X, put the date on it. And then as you're moving towards a sort of a treatment therapy uh, tool to kind of check in where are we at with that particular goal and we don't have to do all domains we just pick one and let's focus in on a few things that you can do for yourself. There's been wonderful research that so you can see the numbers are showing the CBT for parents of children with autism have shown pre and post treatment that there have been excellent effects with CBT interventions and research. There's also been Yona Lunsky, Kenneth Fung, Lee Steele, the gurus that taught me ACT. So as we can see, there's more and more research being done. And the model is a weekend group. It's very intense. And then a weeknight, a, a month later to follow up. And it's been showing excellent, excellent research. And it continues to be run through Caminations Replace. So we're trying our best to continue to do ACT. It's a really great model to use. But I really want to focus in on what, what do we need to be doing and moving forward from here. So the idea that learning about disability is a shock to parents, it's um, similar to PTSD, and just so that you're aware that the experience of even the parents of children with autism, that stress level is the same as a veteran. I don't know if you've thought of that before, but that is what the research is showing. Can you imagine that the stress level of, of parenting a child with autism is the same as someone who's been in a war? It's a powerful statement to think about. It's just unbelievable. But the research is showing that. But when you think about the stress levels that they don't have a break, they're dealing with flashbacks. I'm waiting for my next beating every day. I'm bracing. It's so stressful. And I'm constantly dealing with flashbacks and nightmares. And I don't, there's no end in sight. That's what they're experiencing every day. The enduring levels of stress, there's high risk of suicide. I've heard it. I've asked about it. We've talked about it. The impact of the family is huge. So children's, grandparents, everyone. And there are issues like cultural issues that may impact all of those things. So having some stigma around hiring a respite worker or looking at long-term placement, having a good support system is important. There's always new challenges at each transition levels to the transitional age youth, to the adult system. All of those challenges are gonna be there. There's a huge burden on the siblings. There's an important need to talk about long-term placement. The impact of family is important and what, how does that family influence the, the nuclear family? The self-care is so critical for these families because they're already so burnt out. So what is my vision? What is my hope? My dream is that we have a social worker with 
the family to write a diagnosis, like I say. The cultural and family impact is huge. The trauma is huge. The impact on the couple is huge. They don't understand what's going on. There's huge feelings of grief and loss. There's only that parent positive adult development group that's running. There are psychologists it's really, that, are, that are taking on the counseling role right now. They are time limited. Um, I can work with whatever goal I want. I don't necessarily have a specific end date in the work that I do. I don't have, I, if the family's talking about something that's unrelated to the goal, that's okay. So I have some flexibility. I do have to end when the, the family leaves our program, but we do, social workers and so, social workers have that flexibility to kind of work, go where the family's at and be unstructured. Having the counseling now, right? That elementary and transition year. So being able to, knowing there's great research on ACT, growing there's, there's great work being done on parent support groups. I'm trying to get something published hopefully um, around the group that I'm running, looking at parent, family and sibling couple counseling. I'm telling you, I'm constantly putting out fires every other day because the family's level of crisis right now is through the roof because of dealing with all the behaviors at home. There's constant, constant level of behavior, dealing with lack of sleep, all those concerns every day. Having that importance of a long-term discussion is so critical. Working with someone called a service coordinator. Now we're bonus because in Family Services Toronto have hired service coordinators. These are the people that can help with the resources and supports. They're social workers, thank goodness, because we can partner with them and say, this is what the family needs and who else best understands. Our social service workers and our social workers understand best what's going on with these families. And it makes treatment planning more seamless and successful. Have you looked at this aspect? What about this? I'm gonna follow up with this. We're just keep working together as a partner. Let's do group uh, sessions, joint sessions together. It makes a beautiful collaboration. The level of stress, like I said, is th really, really high. So being aware and understanding the need for um, PTSD interventions, their, their PTSD is very high. The level of trauma, extremely high. Their level of crisis is constant. We need services to wrap around families. So bringing in their family supports, bringing in their internal supports, who do they connected with in the church? Who are they connected with, with the group? Helping them deal with language issues, the isolation, navigating the system, you know, all of those things. They have these map around models, they call them family driven, but they make the families keep calling. Well, families don't have time to call anybody. So I actively have these sessions with families and I don't make them call. That's that's just more work for them to have to do. They don't have time. Some of them have three or four special needs kids. I'm sorry, they don't have time. Um, but also partnering with racialized families. Again, we are the only ones who understand that level of what's going on. Awareness of our privilege, awareness of how counseling needs to be different. I use language like, how are we coping today? How What's your level of stress? I never say, you're going to go see a counselor um, and talk about counseling with a social worker. Don't use that language. It's not going to work. You have to say, what's your level of stress today? We have to understand that we have to be engaged with these racialized families and speak to them in a way that's destigmatizing. The importance of respite, having someone who can manage their child, having that bit of a break for them, but having that multiple conversations. Like I said, other people will not understand, but only we understand that that conversation needs to happen multiple, multiple times. And how do we do that without having them see anything? Assessing the need for suicide and trauma. So we're the only ones who understand the complex needs of the family and assessing the thoughts of suicide. We can understand the stress and coping and help them figure out what to do. We are often assist trained. So we know what's a sign of burnout. When, when do we ask that question when we can see the level of stress increasing? We can hear it from their voice. We understand that right from intake. And that is why social workers should be the only one doing the social work intake. Nobody else, because no one will also understand that needs of the family. Being able to advocate with families and helping them with long-term placement and planning dealing with their grief, dealing with the possibility of residential placement. It takes six months to a year to get to even get to that point where they're in residence. So helping them through that process, helping them through their readiness, working, collaborating with that special needs team and service resolution and service coordinators, discussing all the options available to families and mapping out their vision of the future based on their needs and their isolation because they don't have those other supports. And being able to provide those warm transfers to agencies. So we use that system terminology and clearly articulate and identify their support needs. Helping them 
dealing with those difficult discussions. So broaching that topic over and over again, what is your capacity? Do you think you can do this long-term? Dealing with their diagnosis, dealing with the advocacy with the other systems and supports, knowing that there's great wait lists in the adult system, there's loss of funding, there's diff, you know, there's, we have to figure out how to register with the DSO, all of those things. How do you do that? What do you need? What's the paperwork? All of those things, we're gonna have those discussions. There's a young adult program at uh, Surrey. That's great, I'm so thrilled. Um, and I'm thrilled that we have social workers in the adult team to collaborate with. Their wait lists are huge too, by the way. So knowing that there's only so many resources and only so many supports. But like I say, I'm grateful that we have at least other social workers in the agency that we can speak about how difficult these stressors are on the family and how ingrained and how what the challenges are as a team. It's been it's a true pleasure to work with everyone. I also collaborate a lot with the psychologists. So it's been wonderful to have us talk about clinical approach. We have a very strong collaboration and coordination. So that is I've come to the end of the discussion. I'm wondering if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, no, really, your passion and energy for this work uh, is evident. So thank you so much. Um, uh, and the comments, uh, there are lots of great comments and discussion in the chat, and there are lots of questions. So, uh, you know, you've given us lots to think about. So why don't I start with sure, going sure. through the questions? I will just jump in and say one of the overarching questions that has come up is a, a request if you can share your resources. So I just wanted to get that sure, out there, too. Sure. Um, but there's some great questions. I'll start with the first one. Um, what sort of additional and specific training would you recommend MSWs get to be able to, to work in the uh, disability field? And this individual says they've had you know, tough luck breaking into this area since most of them ask for extensive experience in ABA or similar areas, which is different than MSW training. Any Absolutely. thoughts on that? Absolutely. And then it's interesting because I'm sitting in it often I'm sitting in a team meeting and they're talking about functional assessments and my eyes just kind of roll over because I don't understand a lot of the behavioral terms, but it's good to have some basic knowledge of it. So the way to get that is like some shadowing of some of the programs. Again, I'm unique to my program, um, but I think also what's interesting is that there is in the MSW program at U of T they're actually piloting a developmental course on disability. So maybe taking that course, um, I, I can't remember if Keith is part of that or not, but um, I remember doing some of that curriculum development for them with research articles. I talked about the parental stress and the other social workers had some input too. So knowing that you actually had input from people working in the field, it's a new field. So that's why it's hard to break into. I understand that real role. Um, and I broke into it myself like, by fluke, basically, but um, my suggestion is to take that course, um, and as well as some, any ACT training would be valuable as well. Thanks so much, uh, Tina. Um, you can probably uh, take off your uh, share screen now, Tina, too, sure. so there we go. Let me go on to the next question. There we go. Uh, let me go on to the next question. Um, here's an interesting one. How do you navigate working with families self-diagnosing their children and upon meeting with the client, seeing they are higher functioning than the family expresses? Uh, so I guess this person is saying it seems as though perhaps the parent is driving the narrative and, and, and they may have a different view about the, the actual uh, uh, child's ability to function at the level that child can yes. function at. Any thoughts yes, on that? It does happen. So there's a discrepancy because we have a psychologist in the team that will do the testing. So the testing is really the the way we can kind of help rate what's going on. So they'll say, yeah, they do this at home. And they'll take that into consideration when they do their diagnosis. And it has happened multiple times where the family has a different sense of what's going on. And they, they may do that at home, but they may not be able to do that in the school. But this, the psychologist does come in. She's very well trained um, in this field. I don't know, 12, over 25 years or something. So she understands that it might be, I have to come in a few times to do the testing. But how do I navigate that? We do a lot of counseling around how do you feel about how they're functioning? What's happening in the classroom? How do you think they're going to manage? Are they able to even manage them to the school? What's going on in terms of behavior? So the behaviors often just get in the way, right? So they can't really function. Yeah, okay, maybe they're doing somewhat well in certain areas, but often our the kids in our program are uh, like developed, like, um, intellectual disability. So they're quite low to begin with, but they do have that sense of something's a little bit different, um, but we have multiple conversations. So often, again, another suggestion, social worker needs to be in as part of that uh, psychological feedback 
so that we can hear and help navigate some of those questions and concerns that come up when, because the feedback session happens with once, right, with the psychologist. And like I said, she's very collaborative, but I have to sit in on it so I can help deal with some of those questions that those families are experiencing. In terms of resources, the, the group is something I developed by myself, but there are like other research I think I've cited that I can share for sure. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Tina. Here's another very interesting one too. Um, what are community supports and agencies for autistic teens and their families? Interesting. Uh, this individual says that I find many resources are allocated for children who are phased out once they reach a certain age. Mm -hmm. There are many, uh, many gaps in the school system where oh parents and teens don't feel supported. Absolutely. So um, in terms of, re like, because again, no, no social work, <laughs> uh, can't refer for anybody. Um, but for service, not like, so your services supports resources, that's your service coordinators, and they are available to 21. You get a fantastic one with that social work background that we want, social service background, anybody who can understand the family dynamics, you're golden. They will keep the families to 21. So that's where you're going to have a greater bang for your buck. So that's through Surrey, that's through Family Services Toronto, um, anywhere, any Toronto agency that basically, or, or obviously in Ontario, they have their own regions to be able to call and say, I need a service coordinator. What else can I do? So there's some regions that have social work. I think Peel and Waterloo, as, as far as I can think of, have a couple, these one or two odd social workers in the field, which is nice. Um, but it's a it's very rare, and I'm sure they have huge wait lists. But um, for that service navigation, you you're going to ask for something called a service coordinator or a coordinated service planner. That even involves even more systems. Great, thanks, Tina. And I just want uh, everyone to know we we are um, a bit over time, but since this is the last session, we can certainly take a few more minutes to go through some questions. Tina, is that okay with you? Uh, I'm totally fine. Okay, let me move on to the next question. Um, again, here's an interesting one as well. Um, Okay. Oh, sorry. I just lost track. Where is my, uh, okay. Any advice for families dealing with a lack of resources, as well as for families with a lot of police contact due to aggression in the home. So families who are having to navigate uh, dealing with a lot of police contact because of issues around aggression. I Any think ideas that, yeah. Work? Again, I think that's where your social worker can advocate because even CAS gets involved. I'm like, they need to close the file. Like even with police, it's because maybe their their aggression towards children or or them or the parent or as I said children's aid could be involved for the same reason but we're going to help close those files because there's nothing unless the parents are doing something to actively harm there's no reason for that right but unfortunately that's kind of the model and and for our those kids the level of aggression is going to increase with the police coming in and, and scaring them with the handcuffs and everything. It's going to be huge triggering. So I would say collaborate with community agencies, call, 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 call their intakes and see if you can get a service coordinator. Or like I said, a coordinated service planning, especially when there's multiple police involvement, there is an urgent response team as well, just so that you guys know, in, especially in Toronto. Um, and, and as well, if, if you can get the social worker, great, but if not, that service coordinator is going to help navigate some of those issues for you and, and help advocate so that the families don't get those multiple calls. I do know there's a lot of issues with resources, but I think every area in Ontario should have a service coordinator. That's, that's something that's been mandated by the government. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tina. Another very interesting question. What about families that don't know that their child is on the spectrum and, and they're really just thinking that their child is just behaving badly and they don't know about ASD at all? Yes. And this uh, uh, individual also talks about perhaps their systemic racism, systemic racism that might be affecting the dissemination of knowledge. Any Absolutely. thoughts on that? And even, you know, yeah, systemic issues, systemic racism, racialized trauma, like all of those things that you get this like this is a label and I don't even know if I attach to, you know, so-and-so is autistic. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, maybe they're ADHD and anxiety. Like you never know what's really going on. I, I, I hate that they're kind of like pushing it, but I can see why. So your early year centers, your daycares, all of those things are doing all those screens up front. So sometimes they'll be able to flag things very quickly and you should be able to get a diagnosis sometimes quite early, but I would rather say meet with a psychologist and say, these are my concerns. I, I wouldn't necessarily like maybe the board one and maybe not because I don't know if there's an angle or there's an approach that they might use, but maybe just having an, a conversation with either community psychologist or private psychologist to say, look, this is my worry. Maybe, maybe it's this, but maybe it's this, like, I don't know. Can you just run a whole bunch of, maybe it's anxiety. Like we don't know. Maybe it's social anxiety. Maybe it's something different. Maybe it's something sensory. Find out more and, and do a thorough um, assessment 
because you want to make sure that we've covered every part of it and just say like, maybe we need to rule out is ASD has its own sort of there. They use the ADOS, right? They use their own set of tools. Do I need to use that tool or not? Or maybe I need to do, do the tool and then rule it out. And then we can focus in on whatever the other diagnosis that you're concerned about. The important thing is to partner, right? As opposed to someone just running a test and not informing you of the process. So that's why I'm like, do it uh, elsewhere, where if you feel like there's some systemic barriers and some approaches that you're not, you're not comfortable with, maybe hiring your own person will make you feel like you have more control over the process. Thank you, Tina. I think we ha- we can squeeze in two more. Sure. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone that uh, Tina has agreed to log in to the chat after if anyone wants to stick around, because again, there's great discussion going on. This is fabulous. Um, uh, here's another question. How can low-income families or parents get psychological assessments done for their child? Yeah, so certain regions, like um, I know at York University, they're able to do that. Uh, York region has the CTN network. Like, There's different regions that have an, a wait list and understanding that Peel region, I think, is well-resourced too. They have Peel Crisis Capacity Network. There's certain regions where you can get it for free. Um, wait lists are huge, but it can be done. So you're right. The private psychologist costs a lot of money. You can get it through your school board. You're going to just have to wait longer, right? So maybe two year wait list or something like that. So there are ways to get it for free. So you don't have to pay because I understand those things are like $3,000. We, we do it for free at our agency, right? Um, if you're linked through an agency, you might, you may or may not have access. It just depends. But um, trying to get like, if you were linked to an Aaron Oak, for example, you might have access to a psychologist. So if you're, the more people are linked to agencies, put yourself on every wait list under the sun and try to see if you can get access to something for free. Absolutely. I understand that. I know low, low income families really struggle. Um, and, but knowing the one report will take you through the whole life. So I said, you know, for your DSL, your adult system, all of those things, that one report is your golden report to get you the services you need for life. You don't have to do a reassessment again, which is lovely. Thanks, Tina. And I can squeeze in one more. Yeah. Um, this question is about respite. Uh, one, the question is, do your parents access respite so that they can attend these groups? I think it's a reference to the groups that you had mentioned before. Nope. nope. Okay. They absolutely are welcome to attend the group with their child. So the child come because this is virtual. They can have their kid in the background. They're dealing with their kid and their attending group. It's a welcoming, open environment. I don't want to make it so that we reduce, we have all these barriers because respite sometimes becomes a barrier to attending groups. So often when I was running the groups pre-COVID, it was while the kid was in the classroom, our specialized classroom. So they had that sense of um, they were taken care of, right? So I ran it during the day. Because I'm running it to accommodate some other family's needs at, in the, at four o'clock, um, the kids are home. And that's fine. I, I totally welcome interruptions. We Again, it makes it more real for us to engage with the kids. So I don't insist on that at all. I say, like, have them could be part of it. Let's see your kid. Let's see what's going on. Let's see how you're managing your behavior. Let's see your stress. Um, and again, it's just because it's a chance for everybody to connect and engage with each other and get to know the kids. Um, we'll see what happens, you know, in post-COVID or whatever. But again, I would probably run it during the day when they're when they're available. But if, if it only works best for the families at night, then they're welcome to attend. It's no problem for me. I don't want to increase barriers for families. We want to, again, families, these are low income families. They don't have a lot of money to go find hire people all the time. So let's just reduce the barriers as much as we can. Thank you so much, uh, Tina. We'll, we'll leave it there. Um, and again, to remind attendees that again, Tina will log on to the virtual chat, stick around. If you've got other questions, have a dialogue. There's great conversation going on there. I'm just going to turn on my camera so I can look at you and say thank you uh, for that powerful presentation. I know we all learned something uh, today, and, and thank you very much for the passion that, again, that you brought to this work, that you bring to this work, I should say. Um, Tina, on behalf of the college, I would like to present you with a token of our appreciation. The college has made a donation to the Gore Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund, which aims to build cultural understanding and create a path towards reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Thank you once again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Great. Um, I also want to remind attendees that uh, you'll receive again an email in the next few days asking you to complete a post-event feedback form to share your experience of this year's event. And again, once you complete that form, you will have access to a link to uh, get the certificate of participation that you can print off for your records. And again, uh, if there were sessions that you were not able to attend because there were so many great sessions, um, rest assured that these sessions will be available to you on demand so you can view them at your leisure. 
Uh, and just to wrap up to say this concludes uh, this year's annual meeting in Education Day. I hope everyone had a great time. Uh, and, you know, please take some time to reflect over these past uh, two days. There's been some great topics, great discussions, great questions. Um, you know, the weather is so, so in Toronto. Uh, so, you know, you still can go out and, and walk and, and reflect on these great uh, discussions that we've had over the past uh, two days. And we want to thank everyone for your participation and attendance for this virtual uh, two-day event this year. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Tina. And again, reminder, Tina will be uh, logging on to the chat if you want to stick around to ask some more questions. Thank you so much. Thank Bye you. for now.